China's envoy to Canada, Dr. Liu Xinchun, visits one of the Dominion's great ammunition plants, turning out bullets for the United Nations. The ambassador finds Chinese girls among the women workers, proud and eager to be doing their part. At the world's second largest tank arsenal, Dr. Liu sees the famous 30-ton Canadian ram tanks roll off the line. Invited to ride with the crew, the ambassador is taken over the testing grounds. Today, Canada's war effort, in proportion to her population, equals that of any country in the world. From atop Canada's Parliament Hill, the flag of the Netherlands flies in honor of a royal birth. By order of Britain's King George, Ottawa Civic Hospital is declared Dutch territory that Princess Juliana's third baby girl may be born on her native soil. Prince Bernhardt flew from England by bomber to be here for the event. registration is an affair of state. Christened Margaret Francisca, she's fourth in line to the throne of the Netherlands. Prince Bernhardt, with the two little princesses, Beatrix and Irene, enjoys a midwinter romp in the cold Canadian climate. Simple, democratic people in the family of the United Nations. Casablanca in liberated French Morocco, setting for the historic 10-day meeting between America's President Roosevelt and Britain's Prime Minister Churchill. In a city completely unaware of the drama within its walls, United States Army Signal Corps men string their own communication lines in preparation for one of the greatest news stories of the war. To Casablanca, President Roosevelt flew 4,000 miles from Washington to plan with Prime Minister Churchill the coming offensive, to serve notice upon the axis of the United Nations only terms for peace, unconditional surrender. Strong military guards surround the President's villa. Every road is blocked. Every precaution is taken to safeguard the secrecy of the meeting. United States troops, lining the road for miles, thought they were assembled for a routine inspection. Then down the highway, riding in an Army scout car, came their Commander-in-Chief, the first United States President ever to fly the Atlantic. Vanguard of thousands pouring in every day, American troops are moving to smash the Nazis in Tunisia moving to join Britain's General Montgomery in driving the Axis from Africa. Modern mechanized equipment from the United States passing for the President's inspection. Not since President Wilson reviewed his victorious army upon the battlefields of France has there been such a show of American armed might paraded upon a foreign soil?
Casablanca's well-guarded Anfa Hotel, the United States and British missions meet. The Garons are an armed camp. Only official Army and Navy cameramen are permitted to photograph the history-making event. Beneath the guns of sentries on the rooftop, the high commanders of Britain and America plan for victory. In August 1941, President and Prime Minister met at sea to sign the Atlantic Charter. Today, they meet in Africa to give the world a new charter, a final plan for final victory. Time was when Hitler and Mussolini met in armored trains, and all Europe trembled. Now, Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill have turned the tables. Today, they meet to dictate the terms. Today, they plan the offensive. While an umbrella of fighting planes is on constant patrol overhead, Discussions of ways and means for victory go on behind closed doors. High British and American Air, Army and Navy staffs talk face to face across the conference table. Head of the British and American Air Forces, Sir Charles Portal and General Arnold. Admirals of the British and American fleets, Sir Dudley Pound and Admiral King. Chiefs of the British and American staffs, Sir Alan Brooke and General Marshall. At the American Cemetery at Fort Leote near Rabat, the President's party pauses to honor United States soldiers who fell in Morocco. A salute to the men who gave their lives to prevent further bloodshed. Here, close by the Atlantic, they lie beneath the flag of their country, heroes in the cause of the United Nations. For the first time, General Giraud meets President Roosevelt. Successor to Darlot as High Commissioner of French Africa, Giraud is one Frenchman who refused to bow to the Nazis. Twice he has escaped from German prisons. His talks with President Roosevelt are clearing the way for complete French-African collaboration with the United Nations. The meeting of General Giraud and General de Gaulle with President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill is one of the dramatic moments of the conference. Charles de Gaulle, leader of the fighting French. Henri Giraud, hero of the French army. Personal friends, Giraud and de Gaulle join hands. Their one goal, the liberation of France, the defeat of the enemy. Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill reveal their big story to the press. War correspondents secretly flown in from the African battlefront, from England, from America, hear news that re-echoes in Moscow, in Chongqing, in Ankara, and more important, in Berlin, in Rome, and in Tokyo. Homeward bound by Army Air Transport, the President's next stop is the tiny African Republic of Liberia. Here, American Negro troops are helping guard the coastline of this friendly little nation. Again, riding in a scout car, as guest of President Barclay of Liberia, President Roosevelt sees more smartly equipped United States fighters pass in review. American soldiers protecting another outpost of the United Nations. The presidential plane recrosses the Atlantic to South America. Here, President Roosevelt meets Getulio Vargas, President of Brazil. He assures President Vargas that the west coast of Africa will never again be a threat to the Americas. The Casablanca meeting is history. What Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill planned for 1943 is a military secret. But for the Axis, those plans mean but one thing, unconditional surrender. <laughs>